Good morning. Welcome back to the Monday Study Group. We are working now, having finished the Didache, an early Christian document from the first part of the second century of the Common Era. Uh, we are now working on the letters of Ignatius, which come from the same time period, the traditional date for the death of Ignatius in Rome as a martyr is 108 AD or Common Era. Let's uh, begin uh, our study with prayer as usual. May God teach us the meaning of this text, especially in any way it may be useful to us in our own living. Give us wisdom that we need to be faithful in our time as Ignatius was in his own. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. All right. A um, couple comments. Ignatius of Antioch was the bishop uh, in Syria. Bishop by this time means uh, the leading church official in a major city. Um, we're not talking about regional bishops yet, which have multiple pastors under them, uh, but we're talking about the leading church official in a given city. And they are supported by a council of presbyters or elders who help in carrying out the work. And many of these areas also have deacons uh, that care for the needs of the poor and others uh, who have other kinds of physical needs usually in in a congregation. For some reason, uh, for probably just for being a Christian, I, uh, Ignatius was arrested and taken to Rome. That's a bit unusual in that usually when somebody was arrested for being a Christian, they would be executed where they lived rather than being taken to Rome. Not everybody was taken to Rome. So it's speculated that maybe Ignatius was a Roman citizen, um, that he may have appealed to the emperor. That's all speculative. We simply don't know why Rome would go to all the difficulty of transporting this um, Christian leader all the way to Rome to be executed in the arena. Maybe as an example to others, a warning to others. Uh, we simply don't know all the answers to the questions we've got about the historical situation. But this letter, first letter to the Ephesians, is written from Smyrna. Smyrna is modern Izmir. If you look it up on a map of Turkey, it's Izmir, south of Ephesus. And a group of people from the church at Ephesus, led by their bishop Onesimus, possibly the same Onesimus as re is mentioned in Paul's letter to Philemon, though we don't know that for sure. Onesimus and a group of people, small group, three others, I think, from his church in Ephesus, have come down to meet with Ignatius as he's being temporarily held in Smyrna before he is taken on to Rome. And he writes this letter to the Ephesian church, which likely would have uh, been taken back to the church and read to the church in Ephesus by Onesimus or one of the others who was there with Ignatius in Smyrna. Well, the group this morning did not get through the whole letter. We got up to about chapter 11 uh, and then decided we'd finish it next time and move on to the letter to the Magnesians. The second one we're going to do is the letter to the Magnesians. Let me say a little bit about translations. We, It's a minor problem, but we do run into it when we have multiple translations of the Greek text of this letter of or of any of the letters, multiple translations which differ in wording because the Greek can be translated in more than one way. So 
uh, I am primarily using the translation in the Library of Christian Classics. This is a translation by the editor of this volume in the Library of Christian Classics, uh, Cyril Richardson, C. C. Richardson. And he has, it's a more modern translation than the others that people are using. Now, one of the best translations also is the, is the translation in the Loeb Classical Library of the Apostolic Fathers by Cursip Lake, L-A-K-E, Cursip Lake. And I am, that has the Greek text on one side and the English translation on the other side. Maybe you can see that a little bit. So that lets me look at the Greek and check the translation to see what other variations are possible. And so that's a second good translation. But there's a third one that... Uh, some people are using, and that's the translation from the earlychristianwritings.com website. So if you go to use a, a search engine and go to earlychristianwritings.com, and you'll see a page that appears that lists all the early Christian writings that are known. And you simply have to scroll scroll down that first column and find Ignatius of Antioch and click on that. And when you do, you'll find three different translations of the letters of Ignatius. Now, they're not listed in the same order that we are taking them. In fact, I think the letter to the Ephesians is listed last, but we're doing it first. When you look up Scrolling down, when you find the letter to the Ephesians, I think you'll find three translations. And the best of those, in my view, is J.B. Lightfoot. So that would be another translation you could use. I also noticed this morning in the uh, in-person group that at least three people ordered a book from the internet called The Letters of Ignatius, and I don't know which translation that is. It might be the Lightfoot translation. I would That would be my guess. But I can't tell from Amazon.com what translation um, because it won't let you look at the flyleaf and, and the details of publication. It doesn't tell me what translation. So don't be surprised if I am reading a passage from one of the translations I'm using and it differs from what you are using. So we'll try to connect that, but I, I hesitated to require everybody to use the same translation uh, because you can use the early Christian writings one for free, and very few people would have had either the Loeb Classical Library available or the early Christian Fathers translation from Cyril Richardson. All right, enough about the preliminaries. Let's d dive into this letter to the Ephesians. So, uh, there is a greeting. It begins before there's chapter 1. Notice we have 21 chapters. They're, sm they're short, uh, sometimes just two or three verses, but uh, they are numbered. And there is, before chapter 1, a preface, an introduction in which Ignatius greets the church in Ephesus. He calls himself he calls himself the God bearer. Uh, that is the one who is full of God or God inspired. Uh, the Greek word for that is Theophoros, T H E O Theo God like Theos in Greek, and then Phoros P H O R O S. It literally means one who is bearing or carrying God. He refers to himself as the God-bearer. And he refers to, in this introduction, the suffering or the passion you may have in your translation, the suffering of the church at Antioch 
uh, sorry, the church uh, in Ephesus, which is a sign of their election by the will of God. The suffering was considered to be a positive thing, a sign that you were a true Christian because you were worthy of suffering, and therefore you, it was an honor uh, that you uh, should be happy with. Then in chapter 1, just a couple of highlights. That's kind of what I'm trying to do with the chapters, is just give you a couple of highlights from each chapter. Uh, in chapter 1 and verses 2 and 3, he says that, um, and again, this is the translation I'm using, you'll have something similar. For you were all zeal to visit me when you heard that I was being shipped as a prisoner from Syria. You should have that word in that sentence maybe to find where I am. I was being shipped as a prisoner from Syria for the sake of our common name, the name of Christ or Christian, and our common hope. I hope, indeed, by your prayers, he wants the church at Ephesus to pray for him and to pray that he would have the good fortune to fight with wild beasts in Rome. He wants to be martyred in Rome. He considers it a privilege to suffer and die for the faith in the arena in Rome. If he were a Roman citizen, he would likely have been beheaded rather than having the torture of appearing in the arena and being eaten alive by lions and other wild beasts that Rome had captured in Africa and brought to Rome for the games in the arena. <clears throat> he also says, in addition that to his request that they pray that he would fight with wild beasts in Rome, so that by doing this I can be a real disciple. Martyrdom became a sign of being a serious Christian. And a debate arose about whether should people should seek martyrdom. Once captured, Ignatius wants it. He wants to suffer martyrdom in Rome as a sign, a witness. The word martyr is the Greek word for witness. He wants to be a witness, a martyr, to his faith, to the world, to the pagan world, that this is something worth believing in and dying for so that he can be a real disciple. In chapter 2, at the end of chapter 2, and if you have verse markings, it's in verse 2. In fact, it's the last sentence in verse 2. He says, Thus united in your submission and subject to the bishop and the presbytery, you will be real saints. If you can't be martyred, how can you be a real Christian? Well, for Ignatius, it's vitally important that you be subordinate to and obedient to the bishop and ruling elders in your community. Again, we're in a time when there are no church buildings as such. It may be that Christians rented halls to meet in, although in some places it was so illegal to be a Christian and dangerous that you would meet privately in secret in homes, underground, anywhere you could meet away from the uh, supervision of the ruling authorities, the Roman pagan authorities in that area. How to be a real saint in those situations other than martyrdom, be subject in unity to the bishop and the ruling elders in your town or your area. He says in chapter 3 that he has not yet reached Christian perfection. Um, and that is an ideal or a goal. Uh, we talked a little bit about perfection this morning, and some people don't like that term uh, because they think it gets in the way of knowing about God's grace and forgiveness. But the two are not incompatible. 
And many, many early Christians, in fact, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says at one point, I think it's at the end of chapter 5 in Matthew, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And in the letter to the Hebrews, perfection of life is set forth as an ideal for the readers of the letter to the Hebrews. So while we, while we may not like the word perfection, it was an ideal to be uh, worked toward, not in order to be saved, not in order to be a Christian, but as the working out of the imitation of Christ, the following of Christ, to be like Christ in one's life, one's words, one's attitudes, one's actions, uh, in one's unity with God. In fact, this unity of God is highlighted in chapter 3 when he says that I hasten to urge you to harmonize your actions with God's mind. For Jesus Christ is the Father's mind, as the bishops too appointed the world over reflect the mind of Christ. Why should you be in unity with your local bishop? Because your local bishop is in unity with Christ, and Christ is in unity with God. So there is an alignment there, at least as Ignatius thinks about it, that if you are not in unity, let's state it negatively, with if you are at odds with and disagree with and are insubordinate to your local bishop or presbyters, then you are out of line with Jesus Christ and out of line with God. Now, that may not be the way we think about it today, but this is a time when there is was intense persecution of Christians. There were also heretical movements like Docetism and Gnosticism and eventually Montanism and other Judaizing uh, sects or movements. And all of these were considered by some Christians who came to be understood as Orthodox Christians, not in the Eastern Orthodox or Russian Orthodox or Greek Orthodox sense of that word, but as the approved way of thinking and believing about the Christian life uh, that came to be understood uh, about the fourth in the early fourth century. So being in line with your bishop was very important. It was one of the defenses against heretical movements. So in chapter four, the first sentence, you should always act in accord with the bishop's mind as you surely do, he assures the Ephesians. Your presbytery indeed deserves its name and is a credit to God and is as closely tied to the bishop as strings are to a harp. So there's a unity between the presbyters and the bishop, and we want as Christian communities to be in line with, he is saying, we want to be in line with the bishop's mind which reflects the mind of Christ. To be in perfect harmony, he uses a musical term, like a choir in perfect harmony, singing in unison also with one voice to the Father through Jesus Christ. It's important to abide in irreproachable unity if you really want to be God's members forever. That's where chapter 4 ends. Now, he has mentioned that he has gotten to know Onesimus, the bishop of Ephesus, who's come down to Smyrna to visit him. And he congratulates the church on having such a good bishop uh, who is a fine leader uh, under Jesus Christ with the Father. That is how unity and harmony come to prevail everywhere. In fact, make no mistake about it, this translation says, if anyone is not inside the sanctuary, that's a way of referring to the authority of the bishop. It's a word that means temple or place where religious observances are held. But here it's symbolizing the realm of the bishop. If you're not inside the sanctuary, 
you lack God's bread. In other words, your celebration of the Lord's Supper is not acceptable. It's not the true Eucharist. It's not the way the Lord's Supper is meant to be. The way to have a true Eucharist is to be in alignment with and obedience to the bishop in your area. So let's, at the end of chapter 5, so then let's avoid resisting the bishop so that we may be subject to God. Chapter 6 emphasizes the bishop's silence. The more silent he is, the more we should pay attention to what he is saying. In fact, we should regard the bishop as if it were the Lord himself. That's at the end of verse 1. And he can say of the Ephesians that they are doing that, that uh, they have, uh, uh, that their bishop Onesimus has spoken very highly of their conduct. The bishop is the anchor of stability, the anchor of orthodoxy in any given region where he is leading. Now, one of the reasons for emphasizing again the authority of the bishop is revealed in verse in chapter 7, there are wicked and deceitful teachers acting unworthily of God. They are wild beasts and must be avoided. Uh, and the only way to avoid them and to be healed of their bite, according to verse 1, is to appeal to the true physician so here's how the end of chapter 7 reads in the Cyril Richardson translation. There is only one physician, of flesh, yet spiritual, born, yet unbegotten, God incarnate, genuine life in the midst of death, sprung from Mary as well as God, first subject to suffering, then beyond it, Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's a creedal statement. That's the kind of thing that might be recited in a church setting, in a worship service, as a statement of faith, an affirmation of faith, like a creed, uh, like an early Apostles' Creed or a Nicene Creed. There are a number of these creedal statements in the New Testament as well, and you'll find that there's more than one in these letter letters that Ignatius writes as well. So the second half of chapter 7 is an early Christian creed. In chapter 8, he refers to himself as a cheap sacrifice. That's how Richardson translates the Greek word there. Uh, it's probably, in your translation, the third sentence in chapter 8. He, does, he thinks of himself as an easy sacrifice, a cheap sacrifice for the Romans to make uh, a despised person in the eyes of the Romans and yet honored by the church for his martyrdom. He urges them to live good, strong, spiritual lives in faith and that they should do everything under Christ's control. That's the last sentence I have in chapter 8. Do For you do everything under Christ's control. Literally, you do everything in Christ, uh, one of Paul's most common phrases in Paul's letters. Doing everything as if you were indwelling in Christ, under Christ's influence and control, as if Christ were the sphere in which you live and move and have your being. Chapter 9, again, it refers to false teachers whom the Ephesians have resisted. And then there's this wonderful little metaphor about the church of Ephesus being like stones of God's temple, ready for God to build with, being hoisted up like building blocks, being hoisted up by Jesus Christ using the cross as a crane. 
and the rope that's hauling them up in their being built into a holy temple is the Holy Spirit. The rope you use is the Spirit, and your faith is what lifts you up, while love is the way you ascend to God. So the an effort on the part of Ignatius to use a building metaphor with the cross as the crane and the Holy Spirit as the rope that lifts them up as building blocks into being a new temple of God. The second part of chapter 2 changes the metaphor to a religious procession in which they are carrying God as a shrine or Christ or holy objects decked out head to toe with the commandments of Jesus Christ. Clearly a metaphor of the progress of the Christian life with overtones of pagan processions carrying religious shrines. Uh, Richardson points that out in a footnote that it was likely a reference to pagan processions in honoring perhaps an Ephesus of Artemis, the god goddess of the Ephesians. And people would be dressed in a special way and carry small shrines or amulets of the goddess. Chapter 10, keep on praying praying for others as well as yourselves that they might be converted and get to God. Let them learn from you at least by your actions and so be humble. Return bad attitudes with gentleness. Return boasts with humility. Return abuse with prayer. In the face of their error, you be steadfast in the faith. If you receive any violence, return that with mildness and do not be intent on getting your own back. But by our patience, let us show that we are their brothers, intent on imitating the Lord, seeing which of us can perhaps be the more wronged, the more robbed, the more despised, that no devil's weed may be found among you, but you might be thoroughly pure and self-controlled and you will remain body and soul united to Jesus Christ. In other words, this is like the Sermon on the Mount, turning the other cheek, praying for and loving your enemies, being humble and not retaliating and not using violence when violence is used against you. And so we come to chapter 11 where the Monday study group ended today. We noted here that this chapter 11 begins with the last days are here. You may recall from our study of the Didache that that was also a theme in the last chapter of the Didache, that eschatological chapter in which last things and the last days and judgment and the a rising up of a man of lawlessness and so forth was talked about. Here he doesn't go into quite that much detail, but he says the last days are here and we should fear the wrath to come or value the grace that we already have, one or the other. Uh, only let your lot be a genuine life in Christ. Uh, so he uh, is saying to the Ephesian church that he wants them to be numbered among Christians who have one mind, the very mind of the apostles. He knows that he's a con convict, but they are free. He's in danger, but they are safe. You are a route for God's victims. That is people who would be taken to the arena to die in the arena in Rome will often pass through Ephesus because it was a population center of Christians who might be taken to Rome to die uh, because it was a major port. So you are a uh, the way in which many people would go to to Rome to martyrdom. Paul also is mentioned here as a saint and martyr who deserves to be praised. When I come to meet God, may I follow in his Paul's steps. And so that's the end of chapter 11 and actually most of 12. Uh, we'll stop there 
uh, and pick it up with uh, chapter 13 next time in the video. Uh, I urge you to uh, read the article on Ignatius of Antioch in Wikipedia. Again, you know how to do that. Just use a search engine, go to Wikipedia, type in Ignatius of Antioch, and you'll find a biographical uh, review there as well as other information and the scholarly debates about the life of Ignatius and how we are to understand his letters. So thank you for being willing to enter into the life, not just of the New Testament or of the Old Testament, which we did with the wisdom literature, uh, but, uh, but with the life and thinking and struggles of Christians in the second century AD, the period of the apostolic fathers and others who were trying to spread Christianity throughout the Roman Empire, often in times of severe persecution. All right. As I prayed earlier, may we all be as faithful witnesses in our time as Ignatius was in his. Thanks be to God.